16 is what we're springing off of and then they come up on the screen. Look at what it says. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. We were eyewitnesses of His majesty. It was more than a story. It was an experience, in other words. And I was thinking this week, isn't it odd that millions of people all around the world participate in a celebration at this time of year without even knowing the one that the celebration is all about? Without even having an experience with Him. And how sad it is to miss out on an experience with, with Jesus. And, and maybe even just have religion or, or whatever. Or just outright rejection. But how sad it is to, to miss out on an experience with Jesus. Especially at this time of year. And that's my prayer. That's our focus. I pray that this year it will be so much more than a story for you. But this Christmas time will be an experience of Christ with you. That you'll know His joy. That you'll know His peace. That you'll know His comfort. That you'll know His hope. That you'll know His life in you more than you ever have before. And it'll be so much more than a story. Now I don't know what it takes to get you in the Christmas spirit. I imagine for all of us, it's a little bit different. Maybe uh, for you, it's uh, when they start playing Christmas music. And usually, there are, are people in one of two categories when it comes to Christmas music. Some of you think that uh, they should... Uh, uh, start playing Christmas music when they put the decorations out at Walmart. In other words, in June. And uh, uh, no, I'm not in that camp. Others of you, you get your fill of it one day a year on Christmas Day or whatever. Or others, you like it when you come in here. So maybe it's the, the music that gets you in the spirit. Others, it may be uh, when you put up the Christmas tree or the lights or or uh, the the eating or the, the, the Hallmark movie that you never can predict how it's going to turn <laughs> out. Tammy watches those stupid things. They're so stupid. Anyway, just kind of airing out. For me, it's kind of a fight for the Christmas spirit and to maintain it. It just really is. Tammy talked me into going Christmas shopping with her the other day. Drives me bonkers. That we would spend three hours and 45 minutes and drive all over the place to save $2.50 and then and then not buy some stuff because it's not on sale. It might be on sale for 20%. I'll give you $500 if I can get it and go home. If, I mean, it just gets me totally out of the spirit. I'm like one husband who wrote, the wife is shopping for Christmas gifts with purchases small and large. She doesn't believe in Santa Claus. She believes in Master Charge. And that's, that's, that's where it gets sometimes. But I want to talk about something very essential to the real meaning of Christmas that many times just gets skipped over. We're going to talk about today the humanity of Jesus. And ever since that, that very first Christmas... It, it's been a fight to, to get all the truth into what it's all about. You know, we, we've come to this time of year many times and we talk about His deity. In other words, it's important that we realize that the Christ child that was born is and was God. 100% human, 100% God in the flesh. He's God. Had to be to do what He claimed to do. And to be who, who, he, who he is and, and to accomplish what he, what he came to do. But in that fight over the reminder and, and constantly coming back to the need to be reminded that he is God, we've forgotten about his humanity. Now I want you to look in this verse in 1 John. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God, the Apostle says. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So here's a reminder. It's just as important for us to realize that Jesus actually did come in the flesh. And as a matter of fact, you cannot be a true authentic believer unless you believe that He physically came in the flesh. And the reason this is so important is not long after the ministry of Christ and after He ascended, one of the attacks on Christianity was this. 
that false teachers began to teach that he was only a spirit. He did not actually come in the flesh. And so that's why God led these writers in verses like this and in many other places in Scripture to, to write as He inspired them to tell us its truth. He came in the flesh. And the humanity of Jesus is as fundamental for our faith as the deity of Jesus. So why is it so important? That we understand the, the humanity of Jesus. Why is it so important that, that we focus on His humanity? And I want to give you three reasons today. First one is this. It's all about incarnation. In other words, Jesus became a human being when God supernaturally, listen, God supernaturally touched the belly of Mary and put His Son in her belly when there had been no sexual contact between Mary and any other man. I want, I want to... Uh, is Kyla here back there? Kyla, come up here. Bring legend up here. I want, I want to do something. Now think about this. It's the miracle of the virgin birth. The miracle of the virgin birth. And it's so meaningful to, to think about how it all took place when God supernaturally did that. I want you to meet Legend. Isn't that a cool name? This is Legend. He was born in June. Is that right, Kyla? Would he let me hold him? Come here. I remember when he was born this summer. He's so cute. Isn't the Legend neat? I mean, I got stuck with Kevin. This is Legend. <laughs> he knows a papa when he's a... <laughs> look at his little hands. And what it's six months old now Mom? Yeah. His little hands, his little feet, his little eyes and nose. <laughs> he's got hair. <laughs> Aren't babies amazing? This time a year ago, he was still being formed in his mother's womb. I was reading this week about how at inception, an embryo is half the size of a grain of sand. And in the womb of its mother, that little embryo, that little life, it's life, from the moment of conception, Amen. it begins to be formed. And he's still developing. His little hands, his little eyes, his feet. <laughs> this is working out great. <laughs> Isn't it good just to go back to the reminder? our development and do you know let me give him back before we ruin a good thing right <laughs> do you know that very same thing happened with Jesus he came into this world in his humanity and started at half the size of a grain of sand. But here's where it was different for Jesus. That wasn't His beginning. Jesus always had been. You see, that's why the, the Bible says that His name is I Am. He's not I was, He's not I will be, He's I Am. He always has been. He never had a beginning. That's why Genesis 1 says that uh, it, when, when God's Word talks about creation, it says, uh, God speaking, let us form man in our image. Because Jesus was there in the beginning. And so Jesus became small, but it was a demotion because he, he was big. He was awesome. He was there. He always had been. Matter of fact, look at how Colossians talks about it. You, may, you might remember these verses from when we covered Colossians this past year. Look at what Colossians says. 
Christ is the invisible is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Listen, this is talking about Jesus. Everything was created through Him and for Him. He was big, but He became small. Talk about love. Talk about a demonstration of humility. Talk about a demotion. James chapter, or I'm sorry, John chapter 1 and verse 14. If we can go back to it. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Talking about Jesus. He became flesh, made His dwelling among us. And we have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. He was big but became small. We start off small and become big. Have you ever thought about this? That little Christ child in the womb of Mary that started half the size of a grain of sand began to develop and grew. Those little hands that were formed were formed so that nails could be driven through them as He hung on the cross. Those little feet that were formed were formed so that He could walk up a lonely hill to die on the cross for you and for me. That head that was formed was formed so that a crown of thorns could be thrust upon His head. His whole body was formed so that a spear could be thrust into His side as He poured out His life for you and for me. Listen to me. The birth of Jesus alone brings no salvation. It took the cross. And He who was big became small so that He could grow and die on a cross for all of the world. When we had nothing to give Him but need, we had no goodness in and of ourselves, He humbled Himself in that way. Think about this. Think about how how amazing this is. Jesus became a member of the human race so that we could become a part of God's family. He had an earthly birth so that you could have a heavenly birth. And you would never have a heavenly birth if He had not had an earthly birth and then go to a cross for you. He was born to die for our sins so that through His life, We could die to our sin and be born again. That's the incarnation. Second of all, His humanity is about identification. This is such a wonderful teaching in God's Word. And I got a way I want to illustrate it. I brought my my suitcase. And I want to illustrate it. If you ever see me apart from church, usually... I've got a hat on. I love to wear hat. I wear caps all the time. And, and a lot of reason I, I wear caps is I just like to identify with different things, different people. And, and I, I brought some examples of that. Uh, you've been to Alaska? I've been there too. I got a, I got a hat from Alaska. I, I've got a, a hat from um, Uganda, Africa. I've been there. Got a hat. That's my souvenir. When I came home, you say, "Oh, I've been to Africa." Me too. We got that in common. I identify with you. And then I, I, I've got other hats. I, I've been to Jerusalem. I have been. I, I've been saved. I wear hats like this sometimes. In the beginning, God. That just takes care of it. Uh, I, I've got hats like this. My, my staff at Spring Hill 
bought me this hat because of my tendency to zone out during staff meetings. And so they, they bought it for me and it says, I'm probably not listening to you. <laughs> so if you've got ADD, I can identify with you. I mean, uh, I've, got that, I've got that in common with you. I've got uh, uh, some hats that I wear that uh, are uh, the, they're according to what I've done or I do. I used to be the chaplain at Green County Sheriff's Department down at Spring, uh, Springfield. Now I'm a chaplain with the Highway Patrol. And so I've, I've got that. You're in the Highway Patrol I, or the chaplain. I can, I can identify with you. Here's one of my favorite hats. It's my fishing hat. This hat says, here, fishy, fishy, fishy. And and I like to I like to wear it. I, we, you you like to fish? I like to fish. We got that in common. This is my hiking hat. I love to go hiking. This is my North Face hiking hat. Dry fit, sweats like a dog. When I, this is my. Hat. We love the mountains. This this hat says uh, the mountains are calling and I must go. And uh, we love the mountains. We got that in common. Then I, I love I love sports. Now first I'm a Chillicothe Hornet. And uh, Nolan Parks got this for me. This is a Chillicothe hat and it, it says Kev Dog on it, right there. You, you might be able to see it. No one thinks I'm Kev Dog. I don't know why. That makes it. And then, of course. <laughs> now, hang on. I'm trying to identify. I identify with Jake, don't I? I know I identify with more. And I also happen to be a Mizzou Tiger. I can identify with you, huh? And uh, I also, because we lived in Springfield, I am a Missouri State Bear. And uh, down, down in Springfield, I like that hat. And then if I really just want to go all out, all right, you guys are here. I've got one of these. I don't wear it in public, but I, I've got one. And I can identify with you, okay? But for today, here it is, right here. Now can we identify together? Alright, that's identification. When Jesus came, that's part of my, I messed up my hair. <laughs> All those hats, I spent so long this morning. That, that's what He came to do. He came to identify with you. I love wearing those hats. You know, when I, when I go to St. Louis, when I go to a Royals game, whatever it might be, we're all identifying with each other. We're together on this. And when Jesus took on our humanity, that's what He was doing. He came to enter our life experiences with us. So that Jesus Christ Himself, listen... This is going to get gooder. <laughs> so that Jesus Himself could say to you, I know what you're going through. Whatever you have going on in your life, whatever you might ever have to face, Jesus has already faced it. Look at this scripture in Hebrews. Chapter 2. Because God's children are human beings. That's us, right? You're a human being, right? We're made of flesh and blood. The Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could He die. And only by dying could He break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could He set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help you. He came to help me. He came to identify with us. So nobody can ever think, nobody should ever think, okay, He has no idea what I'm feeling and what I'm going through. He does. Think about this. Jesus can sympathize with us because, because He came in the flesh. That means when He was here physically on this earth, He got hungry. He was thirsty. Bible records examples. He got tired. He slept. He got cold. He got hot. He had emotions. He had feelings like us. 
He loved, he was happy, he grieved, and he cried. He got sad, he was troubled, he was frustrated, he was overcome by future events, he was lonely, and he was hurt. He battled temptation, he was let down by others, he was attacked by others, he had times when others around him just didn't understand. Listen, Jesus has felt everything that you have felt. Hear me, because he was human, he understands. He understands temptation. I've been reading through Matthew this week in Matthew 4. He was led out into the wilderness and he endured temptation. And think about this. He overcome temptation every single time. But he knows the pull of temptation. And so when you and I are tempted and have those same pulls. He, he, he knows that pull. So I can go to Him and I say, Jesus, I, I don't know that I can overcome this. I don't know that I can, I can crucify my flesh like that. I don't know that I, can, that I can overcome what the enemy is throwing at me. And Jesus said, I know just what you're talking about. I know that pull. And by the way, he was successful. He, he, he didn't sin. So let me ask you this. Who do you want to talk to when you're being pulled by temptation? I want to talk to somebody that's good at it. Good at overcoming, that is. Now, if you want to talk to somebody about golfing, don't come to me. I can't help you. It's a silly game. But I, I'm t I, I can't help I can't do it. Talk to somebody that's good at it. When I've got some temptation going on and some pull going on in my flesh, I don't want to talk to somebody that's good at giving in to it. I want to talk to somebody that has constantly overcome it. Jesus had relationships. You know, Christmas is often a time that we think about our torn up family relationships. You know, that weird uncle that you've got to go to the Christmas lunch with or whatever. You just have trouble getting along with, whatever it might be. Some families are really torn up. Do you know, Mark 6 records the first three verses, Jesus had brothers and sisters and mom and dad on this earth. He knows relationships. And He's been there. And He, he knows what it was. The, the home He grew up in was very, very poor. Very poor. They, they had nothing he knows what it is to, to be poor. Somebody says, how many, how many in here today are, are single, not married? Some of you are looking around. Oh, there's one. Right there. <laughs> That's not why I asked. Somebody says, he doesn't understand what it's like to be me. Yeah, he does. But you know what? How many of you are married? There you go. You say, he doesn't understand what it's like to be married. Yeah, he does. He's got a bride. You know who it is? Us. And he even knows what it's like to have an unfaithful bride. Because we are one. Look at these verses in Isaiah. He was despised and rejected. He knows sorrow. He's a man of sorrow. He knows heartbreak. He was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sin. He, he, he knows physical pain. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Could I remind you, listen to me. Jesus knows, just in those verses that remind us of the cross, Jesus knows what it's like to be falsely accused. Jesus knows, He understands, He gets that heartbreak. And He also knows what it's like to be mistreated. 
to have his heart broken. And could I tell you this? He knows what it's like to have a loved one die. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. But the last time we see the father of Jesus, Joseph, was when, he was, when Jesus was 12 years old at the temple. And then Joseph drops off the scene. He wasn't there at the cross because he'd already died. So somewhere in there, Joseph died. And have you ever thought about Jesus had the ability to keep him from dying? And he let him die. We don't know how death came to Joseph, but it did. And right there was the one that could have protected him from death. But no, he, he didn't. Why? So he could identify with you. He understands. You know, as a pastor, sometimes, all the time, every week, I have people I talk to they're going through stuff. And I am very, very careful. I try to be very careful. I don't do everything perfectly. But I try to be very careful to never look across the desk at somebody and say, I understand if I truly don't. If I've not been where they've been, I can't say it. But there are some things that I can identify with people in. I can identify with failure. I can identify with, with addiction. And somebody going through it. I can, I can identify the, with someone who's Parents have died. I can look across the desk and say, I get it. But it's so limited. But not with Jesus. You're never going to come across anything. You're never going to encounter anything. But what Jesus has the ability to say to you, I get it. I wrote this in my journal yesterday. I want to read it quick before I give you the last thing. When I think about the humanity of Jesus, this is kind of what came out. There are times life brings us to the place where we're brutally reminded of our humanity. Some, sometimes life circumstances bring us to a place where we, f we feel pain, frustration, drain, weakness, fear, discouragement, loneliness, and on and on. Jesus also had times when He wrestled with things in life in His humanity. And yet, listen to this, He was never separated from the Father. There are many examples in scriptures, but one that stands out is when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane before the cross. It's easy to see his humanity there as he groaned, as he wept, as he asked for help, and he cried out in prayer. As I think of that, it gives me permission to be needy myself. Jesus modeled that he knows what it's like to be needy as a human. How important it is that we don't strip away the heart of Jesus and make Him mechanical, unrelatable, emotionless, unapproachable, and not understanding. I really believe, here's what we need to learn. We need to see the value of the humanity of Jesus for us and let that be our meeting place with Jesus. It's in that place we can admit our weakness, feel known, be okay being seen, know we are understood, find acceptance, feel loved. 
When we miss the humanity of Jesus and don't accept our own, we put pressure on ourselves to perform a certain way, not act human in our walk, and we tend to try to suck it up and stuff it in as we try to function beyond our human capabilities. Because of the humanity of Jesus, you can be with Him, stay with Him, experience Him in the midst of your frustration, hurt, disappointment, weakness, temptation, or whatever you go through in life. Because He has experienced our humanity, we experience Jesus in the toughest moments of life. It's as though Jesus is saying to me, go ahead, be human. I get it. And I can help you. It can be your meeting place instead of your hiding place. It's all about His incarnation. It's all about His identification. And lastly, it's about intercession. Now follow me here. Think about this. Jesus came... And He changed everything. You see, before His birth, the way that a, that a person would approach God was to go to the temple in Jerusalem one day a year. Once a year. And they would bring a sacrifice for their sins, to, to atone for their sins. And, and the high priest would enter the holy place on their behalf. The high priest would go into the presence of God. He was the only one allowed. The, the common person like you and I couldn't go in. There was no access to God for people like us. And all that came through the high priest who represented the people before God. But since Jesus came, everything changed. Look at these verses in Hebrews chapter 4. Okay, so then, since we have a great high priest, that's, that's Jesus. And He's entered heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, let, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He gets it. For He faced all the same testings. And depending on translation, temptations. We do. Yet he did not sin. And let, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. And there we will receive his mercy. And we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. Keep that verse up there, will you? Amen. Because of what Jesus did, look what we can do. we can go into the very presence of God and talk to Him about whatever we've got going on in life. There's nothing you've got going on that you can't talk to God about. The question is, would you look at me for just a moment? Are you really talking to God about what you've got going on? Some people say, well, you know, with what I've had going on and with what I've done, I need to stay as far away from God as possible. Yet look what these verses say. Approaching God, you're not going to find judgment. You're going to find grace and mercy. When you come into His presence and you say, Okay, God, I need you. This is where I've been. This is what I've done. This is what I've got going on. This is where I'm weak. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. You know what you're going to get? Grace, mercy, understanding, and help. When I was first saved, I was thinking this morning, I remember going into, every week, I would go and visit Don Palmer over at First Baptist Church. Every week I'd sit in his office, and I had so much junk to get out. 
You wouldn't believe the wreck and the ruin in my life. And I mean, that office became my safe place. We'd go in there, and I'd shut the door, and he'd sit across from me, and I'd just pour out my heart. It was a safe place. And I had needs and I had hurts. I remember many a week, just like maybe some of you are in here today, you, you've come in and your, your heart's bleeding. You're hurting. His heart bled too. He understands hurt and He wants to help you with it. Man, I'd, I'd go in there and I'd... I poured out. It was such a safe place. And it taught me about what it was like to enter that safe place with God and come boldly to the throne of our gracious God knowing I will always Find acceptance when I'm real. Would you bow with me? And I just want to ask you right now, be real with me. Why not approach God? Why not approach Him with your hurt, with your frustrations, with your fear, with your, with your stuff that you carried in here? Don't take it out with you. Give it to Him. Maybe it's your failure. Maybe it's temptation that's been getting the best of you. Whatever it is. Right now. Right where you're at. You can talk to God. You can come boldly to Him because of what Jesus did for you. He opened the way. And maybe you're here today and you've never talked to God. Never come into a relationship with Him. Wouldn't today be a good day to just say, God, I need You. God, I've got guilt. I've got shame. I've got things going on. I, I just need you, God. Give my life to you. I surrender to you. Others of you, He's just waiting to hear from you. That's why He came. To identify with you. So you could talk to Him in your time of need. Anybody got a need going on? Anybody? Is anybody needy? Got some needs, got some hurts. Talk to him about it. He wants to hear from you. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus, you know where we're at.